The series in the book of Acts is called Overcoming, and we are looking for clues as we walk through how the the church started as 120 people and then exploded to be a worldwide movement. And what would God want of us and for us so that we could be part of that worldwide explosion of a movement of what he wants to do? And the focus this weekend is on encouraging words, how to give them, how to receive them on both sides of it. So let me tell you a story. Many years ago when I had hair, (laughs) I went to be a youth pastor in a very conservative Baptist denomination. And the pastor that I went to serve with was, first of all, from a non-denominational background and we got along well. And, And then after a year and a half, he left. And so I was the only pastor in this church as they were candidating new pastors coming in. And some of them were extremely down-the-line conservative of this denomination. And I knew that I was there being myself. And I had wild curly hair. I had my guitar. I was helping lead the worship, not only with the youth group, but in the church auditorium. And I could tell that some of them, their first official act of pastoring would be to get rid of this wild youth pastor. And one of the candidates' names was Mark. And Mark came, and he's always a great, fun guy when he is in a personal, you know, personal setting. But in formal settings, he's very traditional. He stands very carefully. We used to tease him. We thought he probably had a tie on his jammas. And and he would speak very formally, and when he preached, he always, you know, moved in very formal ways. And so that was the first, you know, time I met him. And every time when we had one of these candidates, there would be this little interview between the candidate and this youth pastor. And so we get together for our little talk, and Mark's opening words were, you and I are a lot different, and that could be one of our greatest assets. And I thought, what a wonderful way to see differences. Instead of to see us as competing or to see us as somehow enemies, Mark was able to say, you have some qualities, I see your heart, and we could combine together. And, and that began four years of a wonderful teamwork. And you know, Mark was a godsend in my life because I was at that wonderful stage of life where I didn't even know what I didn't know. And he quietly and, and confidently led me towards being a better leader and I loosened him up just a little bit, and we had a wonderful teamwork. In fact, his, his statement of his job description was, I came up with the crazy ideas and he okayed them. That's what he said later. But there was this wonderful harmony of people who are different from each other, challenging and encouraging. That's the, that's the picture of what the body of Christ is supposed to be. And way too often, it is not. And so I think we have a clue from the passage this morning, if you've already turned to Acts chapter 18, of some characters that we're going to look at and how God used them in each other's lives, and I hope that that allows us to then say, how is God going to use us in the same kinds of ways? So we'll start with chapter 18, verses 1 to 4. After this, Paul left Athens, which is the message from last week, and he went to Corinth, and there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus. Now, remember last week I was telling you, or two weeks ago, I was telling you about that Bible study starts with observation, looking at the text, looking, asking questions of it, delving in, and your, your understanding of how to interpret and apply it is built on how well you can observe it. And as I was reading through this, have, I know this story, very, very familiar to me, and as I was reading through it, one of the questions came to me like, where in the world is Pontus? Now, I've been to Israel seven or eight times, and so I know where a lot of things are, but I have no idea where that was. So just pay attention as we read through this. This guy from Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. And Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. This is how we know that Paul worked Not only when he was not preaching, he was working as a leather worker, a tent maker, to be able to support himself so that he wasn't a burden to anyone. And so here's this story of people who are coming from different places being knit together, seemingly by accident. 
So Paul stayed on. We're jumping down to verse 18, sorry. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Before he sailed, he had his hair cut off at Centria because of a vow he had taken. They arrived at Ephesus, where Paul had left, left Priscilla and Aquila. He himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So they go together, to, from, they meet in Corinth, they go together to Ephesus. Now jump down to verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So I point this out just as you're reading through the chapter. You're getting all the, the characters in the play, if you will. And let me give you just a couple of, of key words here. I believe that this is all built on a very important understanding of the word sovereignty, that God is sovereign. And sovereign is a word that we use for a king. And essentially what it means is that God is in charge. God is in control. And he's in control not only of the special big miracle things that we see, God is also in control of the daily, the mundane, the things that don't make the the headlines. That if we believe that God is as big as he says he is, then he is able to control everything. And we have to respond to our world as though God is able to be in control. And then past, or the Apostle Paul, he was uh, an apostle to the Gentiles. He'd been r- dramatically saved, and now he's on his second missionary journey. He meets Aquila and Priscilla, who are a Jewish couple. Um, they're a wonderful picture of couples working together um, because they are never mentioned one without the other. They were this team that worked together, and they became partners with Paul. And I think what an interesting picture. Here's Paul, the single guy, traveling by himself, and he becomes connected to this couple, and they work with him, and they are working in harmony and together um, with Paul, and yet he drops him off at Ephesus, obviously, to help strengthen and encourage the church there. And then this new young firebrand, enthusiastic preacher, comes in, but he is missing some vital information. So, that story is to underline this idea that when God brings us into situations, we often see it as accidental or just serendipitous. It's like, I had no idea I was going to run into you. I am not planning it. It's not something we get together weekly and study. But listen to this. God runs you into people all week long, and I believe if your eyes were open, you would realize that some of those accidents are divine encounters where you need to either speak something or hear something. And you and I have a tendency to be way too busy, and we've got our to-do list, and we are working down what we're doing, and I have a good illustration of... I was heading to, to Shop Smart. I was got some things on my list. I had to go somewhere. I'd made a lot of other stops. And as soon as I come in, I see a couple of guys I know that are standing over to the side over by Bymark. And one of them calls me over and says, hey, Paul, come over here. And he was talking to a brother who hadn't been at church for a long time. And there had been some things that had gone on in his life that kind of pulled him away. And he said, I was just telling him how he would be welcome back at family church. And I accidentally came up right at that time. And assured him we would love to see him back. And we talked a little bit and what was going on in his life. And, and that whole thing took four or five minutes. But if you are too busy, you miss maybe the most important appointment of your day. And sometimes it's because you're supposed to speak something. Sometimes it's because you're supposed to hear something. And I think how often those things probably go right by us and we totally miss them. Because we are focused on where we're going or what we're doing, or maybe even worse, we are so arrogant as to think our life is totally about us. And we're not interested in what God wants to do through us or wants to do in us. We are just on our channel. And God wants to interrupt our lives and to say, I've got a plan. The rest of that story is a couple of weeks later, that guy showed up at church again because we had some accidental conversations. And I think that's What I want for us this weekend is to begin to believe that God is at work. If we will join him in his work, we can see amazing ways in which God wants us to become more Christ-like, to become wiser, to, to grow us. But he also wants to use us as we are poured out for the lives of other people. 
And there are critical things that he may be depending on you to speak up, to step up, to be involved. And I think the biggest problem is we just don't notice. We're just not aware. We're not paying attention. And therefore, whew, we're gone and we're by and it's, it's, it's something that's missed. Let me explain to you how big a deal it was that these three people or these four people are together. The Apostle Paul, it says he's from Tarsus. He goes down to Jerusalem. He's up at the church at Antioch, and then he goes all over Asia Minor. He ends up in Corinth, and then he ends up in Ephesus. That's a thousand-mile trip easy. Then you have Pontus, where Aquila is from, is way over here by the Black Sea. That's where my study started as I was trying to figure out where Pontus was. And then he's ended up somehow over here in Rome. We don't know if Priscilla was with him from Pontus or if he met her in Rome. And somewhere along the road, they were not only following a Jewish tradition, they had come to be believers in Jesus. And so when they got kicked out of Rome, they ended up down in Corinth. And they just happened to meet Paul and become connected to him because they had a common vocation. They were tent makers. And that was their beginning relationship, and it went on to be a rich, full relationship as they served the Lord together. And then Apollos is from Egypt. He is an interesting conundrum because he comes from Egypt, he is a Jewish, has a Jewish background, and his name is Apollos, which is for the Greek god Apollo. So he was a cosmopolitan, shall we say. And God takes him somehow from Egypt, and we have no idea where all this went, but he comes to Ephesus. And I'm saying that to say, can God arrange things on that grand a scale to do what he's trying to do in people's lives? Yeah. And I don't think any of them had a clue what was going on at the moment. But in retrospect, they could say, wow, God worked his magic. God worked that miracle. And so he brought them all together so that they could interact in each other's lives. And I underscores the fact that God is at work even when we don't know it. When God prompts you to share something with somebody, when God prompts you to take an interest in your not yet Christian neighbor or the coworker or the fellow student at school, when, when God kind of prompts you to be a part of their life, if you believe that God has already been at work in their life for a long time, it's fascinating to me to talk to people who've come to faith in Christ, and they often tell their story, not about when they first accepted Christ, but they often go back and they say, you know, when I was a kid, I went to Sunday school occasionally, and then I was in a bad accident, and I prayed, and then I felt like God saved me, and they feel like there is pinpoints of God at work in their life, and they only probably see a few of them. And so when you and I begin to realize that when we're interacting in somebody's life, we're just one little piece of a story that God has already been doing and he's already going to continue to do. He's already committed to them. So if you believe that God is at work, it will open your eyes to what he wants for you to be involved with it. And I will tell you, there is nothing more fulfilling or exciting to know than to know that God is using you, He's working in you, He's working through you, and there are those moments in your life when you speak out something to someone and you know that was what God wanted them to know right then. And it's an awesome experience. It's one of those, those transcendent moments where you go, yeah. Does it happen all the time? No. Can it happen a lot more if we were aware? I believe so. So God is at work even when we don't know it, and God wants it to always be a two-way street. Paul was encouraged, I am sure, by the partnership with Aquila and Priscilla. They were challenged to be involved now in this ministry in Ephesus. They left Corinth and went with him, but it was not a senior-junior kind of relationship. It was a connected relationship, and now we see then the the encouragement that Aquila and Priscilla are going to have towards Apollos, and it's going to be more like a senior junior because they know a lot more than he does. But anytime you start interacting with people around spiritual things, everybody is a winner. You know why you should be a teacher? Because teachers always learn more than students. When you're trying to share with somebody else, you've got to do a lot more checking and reading and learning than the people who are just sitting and listening. So that picture of God using us 
you don't need to turn there, but I want to just read to you a verse out of 2 Corinthians, and it's on your outline, and it's a picture that Paul paints of how we interact, maybe even in an unconscious way. He says in verse 15, For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we're an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Paul's saying, everywhere you go, you smell like something. (laughs) You know how focused American society is on not smelling bad? I mean, you'd think that B.O. was a foreign invader trying to take over the planet. And we're all so worried about how we appear and how we look and how we smell. And he said, oh, it's a lot more important than that. The more you are like Jesus, the more you bring essence of Jesus with you wherever you go. And you know how you know that? Because the people who love Jesus are drawn to you and you are an aroma of Christ, a beautiful aroma. And to the people who've rejected You're an aroma of death. You know why some people get irritated when you look like Jesus? Because they're irritated with Jesus. And when the apostles went through that suffering because they were like Jesus, they said, we are glad to be counted worthy to suffer for the name. So that's the cost to it. I, I, I wrote that on your outline, 2 Corinthians, the verses there. Right beside that, would you write, how do I smell? And I think if we were as concerned with smelling like Jesus as we are at not smelling bad, that it would change how we interact. It would change our preparation of our heart before we leave the house. So how does God do that in us? How do people become wiser? I want to drill down just a little bit on the relationship between Apollos and and Aquila and Priscilla and how they were interacting in this connection with each other. And how how do people become wise? And by wiser, I mean more like Jesus. And clearly, it's the Spirit of God that when we come to accept Jesus as our Savior, the Spirit of God comes and begins to work inside of us. And He teaches us and challenges us and convicts us inside. It also comes through the words of God because we do not know what we need to know until we have God's Word in us. And it also comes from the people of God who are around us because they reflect Christ to us and they also challenge us when we don't reflect Christ enough. And all of those together work to bring change to make us wiser, more like Jesus. So let's look at how this happens with Apollos. So I'm going to read, first of all, a couple of verses here from the text in my Bible and then we'll switch on to the overhead there. So, the story of Aquila and Priscilla starts in verse 18, then down in verse 24. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was, listen to his resume, a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor or enthusiasm, and he taught about Jesus accurately, comma, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So, here's the scenario. He comes up, he had somehow been involved, and maybe he had gone up to Jerusalem for one of the big festivals, and he had heard about the story of Jesus, and he had seen his miracles, and he was impressed that he was the Messiah. And so he was going around telling people that Jesus was the Messiah. That was, that was John's message. Repent, follow this Son of God whose shoes I'm not worthy to un- untie. And so he was teaching accurately, but incompletely. And it goes on to say, When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and they explained to him the way of God more adequately. Isn't that a great phrase? They could have said, heretic? What's the matter with you? You know when we judge people, it's usually because we think we're right and they're wrong. It's usually because we are looking down on them and we're moving away from them. And they did exactly the opposite of that. They didn't move away from him. They didn't condemn him. 
In fact, they, it says, invited him to their home. So you know the first part of this process about how people come, become wiser? It requires a relationship. They needed to share some truth with him. And we've talked a lot about this idea of truth in love conversations, about speaking the truth in love and being willing to have a hard conversation if that's needed. And this underscores, again, the love side of it, that they didn't just ambush him after he had finished his message and say, you know what you got wrong? They said, why don't you come for dinner? We're inviting you to come connect with us, to come close to us. And you think about it. Everybody in your life is in some way following the Word of God inadequately. Some of the people around us don't even know about Jesus. They've never surrendered their life to Christ. And, and we have this interesting discussion as we were talking about this message. Is There's a tension sometimes because some of us who've grown up in the church and maybe are an older generation, we see way too many people who know all kinds of truths about God's Word, but they don't do anything with it. They're good people, they're faithful people, but if you ask them, have you witnessed for Christ lately? Are you discipling anybody? Are you pouring out your life anyway? It's like, no, 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 that sounds too hard. I'm just going to study the Bible more. And so they are overdosing on biblical literacy without biblical activity. However, there are other groups, and maybe this is a generational thing, there's a lot of young people who may be enthusiastic about wanting to be part of a cause, but they don't really have the full story of the Scriptures. So they take some of God's Word and some of their own beliefs from the culture, and it gets all mixed up, and they are full of activity and enthusiasm but they don't know the Word of God. And you think, what a great combination this could be, that people who know the Word of God but aren't doing anything with it, and people who don't know the Word of God, what potential is there for interaction and connectivity and sharing? Part of why we challenge you to be in life groups. You need to not just sit in a, in a chair and listen to a message. You need to be involved in observing and interacting and praying for each other and asking questions and being challenged and challenging. And that that is the process of making people wiser. But I want to look particularly at Apollos. You can see that Aquila and Priscilla responded correctly. They heard this young firebrand, and we know from other scriptures that he was eloquent. He was a great speaker. And a great speaker can be very persuasive. And they could have easily either just left him and distanced themselves, ignored him, or they could have criticized him and put him down. And instead, they drew close to him and they said, let us explain a couple things. It says he only knew the baptism of John. <laughs> He's talking about Jesus. He hasn't heard about the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's kind of a big deal, right? Right? And so it says, they explained to him, they invited him to their home, and they explained the way of God more adequately. Look at Apollos' resume. It required, on his part, a deep humility. It is so easy for you and I, when somebody tries to share something with us, maybe it comes across as criticism. What do you do when somebody criticizes you? Don't you immediately begin to think in your, in your mind how they are completely unqualified to instruct you. And I don't know what Aquila and Priscilla's background was, but they're blue-collar leather workers. They're making tents. That wasn't the top of the economic pile, let me tell you. And, and what's his resume? He was educated. He was from the town of Alexandria, and we know that Alexandria was a site of one of the greatest libraries of the ancient world. There were, they estimate, 50,000 to 200,000 papyrus scrolls that were there. And it was a city built around a university. And when it says he was educated, he probably had a lot of higher education. Aquila and Priscilla may have not had hardly any. It says he had a thorough knowledge of Scripture. He had been raised in the synagogue. He understood the Old Testament. He was articulate and could explain and quote the Old Testament. He says, spoke with great fervor. He was enthusiastic. He was eloquent. In fact, later in the book of Corinthians, some people had said, we're for Paul and we're for Apollos and we're for Peter. 
they were putting Apollos on a level with Peter and Paul. So he was a powerful man, and he was telling everything right. But then it says he only knew part of the truth. How well do you handle it when somebody points out something in your life? You see, it's one thing to talk about having truth and love conversations. It's quite another thing to receive a truth and love conversation. And we all would admit that we are not perfect. But none of us likes it when somebody points out how we're not perfect. And I have a funny illustration. Don't get grossed out. You ever seen one of those old guys who has more hair coming out their ears than they have on top of their head? Or have you ever tried to have a conversation with somebody who has long hairs out their nose? You know who I'm talking about, right? And I, and I try to remember that when my wife says, you need to shave your nose. <laughs> I'm having a conversation with her. I'm telling her what's going on, and she's going. <laughs> you know how irritating that is? <laughs> it's like, just listen. And, they, and then I think to myself, so when is a good time for her to tell me that? My daughters used to say when, before they left, as they were heading out the door for somewhere, do I have any penguins on the iceberg? That's code for do I have any spinach caught between my teeth? And you don't want to be that person, but we don't want anybody to tell us about it, do we? And when we have a stinking attitude, it's even tougher to have somebody point that out to you. How do we become wiser? it is critically important to cultivate an attitude of humility. I listened to a seminar on feedback. That was the clever title of it. And what she was really talking about was how do you handle criticism? How do you handle, especially as a leader, when people point out things that aren't quite right? And she made this phrase that stuck with me. She said, other people have information that's critical to your success if you will let them tell you. Isn't that a great way to think about it? They have information critical to my success if I will listen. And when you add in the God part, God is sending his words not only through the spirit within you and not only through the word of God, he's also using the people in your lives because Proverbs says the companion of a wise man becomes what? Wise. That a, a man sharpens his friend like iron sharpens iron. That sounds really exciting till you're actually an iron sharpening an iron. And God says that's his process of working to give us both information we need and to challenge us to action that we tend to take. God wants to work in us, but we often reject it because we think we know better. What a great phrase that says they explain to him the word of God more accurately. I was thinking of that specific phrase, and I was thinking in my life of Julie Brizendine, who has had Lou Gehrig's disease for 16 years, and I don't know of a person who exemplifies the idea of joy in the Lord. You know, we often are happy or sad depending on our circumstances, and she is totally incapable and she is praying for people regularly, and she's sending out cheery emails, and she's watching us online all the time, and she exudes a spirit of joy. And she is explaining to me the Word of God more accurately. I think of Jim Belmar as a picture of prayer, of praying for people and caring for people and following up on them and letting him, them know that he's praying for us. And I think he's explaining to me the word of God more accurately. I can read in the Bible to pray without ceasing, but when I see somebody doing it, it challenges me in a new way. Then I think of the people in my life who have seen lacks in my life and have come along and have challenged me. And you know, the, the problem is, is when we start out, we often know a lot. And we are sophomores you may not know what the word sophomore means. You know why they choose the word sophomore for the person's second year of education, either in high school or college? 
It means wise fool. <laughs> Soft comes from Sophia or sophist, which is wisdom. More comes from the same root that we get the word moron. And what is a sophomore? Somebody who has a little bit of information and thinks they know it all and doesn't yet know what they don't know. You and I are sophomores. And sometimes we pretend that we know more than we do. And we certainly want to look better than we are. And God wants to work in us to help bring those challenges into our lives from the Spirit of God within us, from the Scriptures, and yes, from other people. Do you realize that humility was not even considered a positive quality until Jesus? If you want to read a great book on humility, it's called Humilitas. And he talks about how everybody in the Roman world thought it was fine to brag as long as you could back it up. And to be humble was considered a sign of servitude and weakness. And Jesus reversed that when he said, if you want to be the greatest, you should be like the servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you need to become like a child. And Jesus emptied himself and took a position of great humility. And it became the beginning of a change of culture where even humility is considered a positive thing. And I will tell you, I believe humility is an essential element to becoming more like Christ. We need to understand how much we don't know and we need to allow God to work that in us. For the last several months, we as a team have been working on, our staff team has been working on reframing and rephrasing the vision of family church. And we're doing that partly just because things get old after a while and they need to be refreshed. We also have been wrestling with some new ways to challenge people to live for Christ and to grow in maturity. And we also have been in a fun process where Ed and I are helping the 30s and 40-year-old leaders in our team come and wrestle with the vision and let them express what God's put on their heart so that when Ed and I at some point pass off the scene, there's a vision that's vibrant for family church. And so we have a new mission statement, and let me tell it to you without one word. It's helping people find and follow Jesus. That as a church, we are wanting to help people come to that salvation experience where they understand that Jesus died on the cross to save them from the sin that there's no way that they can save themselves from. That it's the only hope of having eternal life. It's the only hope of living forever with God. And we want them to learn how to follow Jesus. Too many people call themselves Christians, but they've never got the idea of daily and actively following Jesus. And we want to lead people through a discipleship process where they grow to maturity, where they're turning around and discipling other people. That every mature believer ought to be pouring into the life of somebody younger. And what's the word you think that's missing? People. That our new mission statement is people helping people find and follow Jesus. And you know why? Because too often you have a great mission statement and everybody says, that's a great idea. I think the church ought to do that. More specifically, they mean not me. And we want to emphasize that this is about ordinary individuals helping other ordinary individuals explaining the way of God more adequately so that they come to find Jesus and surrender their lives to Him. They learn to follow Jesus in an ongoing, continuous, as long as you're alive, you'll be growing. That's what we want our church to be about. And by introducing that to you and challenging you with that, we're hoping your response is, I want to be one of those people, helping people. I want to be one of those people being helped to find and follow Jesus. And I believe that if we could really adopt that as a heart passion, that God would change Douglas County through us. And I believe that's exactly what he wants to do. The only question is, is that what you want to do? Because God is at work, and he's wanting us to join him. And he's going to run you into people this week, and he's going to give you experiences in your life to bring you to be wise and to allow you to pass that wisdom on. And the only question is, are you down for it? Are you in? Before I give the last two challenges, I want to hand off to our brand new 
South Umpqua campus, and it was great to be in down there with you last week and meet many of you. God bless you, and we love you, and thank you, Green, for our, the exciting things that are going on there, and we trust that God's going to use you in that whole community around you. Let me have you a, a challenge right now. Who's God gifted you to? I don't mean your God's gift to women or God's gift to men. I mean, I mean, look around you in the people in your life and say, who is it that God wants me to pour into? Because I think we vaguely wait for some wonderful experience where they finally drop in our lap, and my guess is they're already right there. You just need to make the connection. You need to invite them over to dinner and have a conversation. You need to take them out for coffee. You need to say, let me check out and see if this could be a relationship where I can pour into you and you can pour into me. And then the second question is, do you have the humility that's required to hear the things that you need to hear? Are you willing to allow God to mold you through the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, and through the people of God? Are you willing to allow yourself to be intentionally put in those positions where you have those conversations, where you can speak the truth and you can hear the truth? And do you want Christ in you so much that you're willing to go through the difficult process of people pointing out where you're not like Christ and allow His Spirit to fill you in? And what I'm telling you is there's no better way to live. Don't settle for second best. Father, thank you for these stories about Paul and Aquila and Priscilla and Apollos. It happened 2,000 years ago, but they're so relevant to what it is that we need to do and be as a church family. What we need to do to be followers of you that become wiser and wiser. And so, God, we do submit ourselves to be people who are helping other people find and follow you. And I pray that this week you might open our eyes and that some of those divine moments that happen in our, in our lives we might be aware of and that we might step into it and listen carefully and speak clearly. And God, you would point out to us how it is that you want to use us, how it is that you want to mature us, and that we would be humble enough to say, yes, work in me and use me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen.